right, so I'm currently on the phone with Todd. He's another musician that reached out about the current interview session. So I'm going to go ahead and give him the chance to introduce himself. Uh, hi there. My name is Todd Grossman. I'm a keyboardist and I'm a solo artist um, releasing music under the name uh, The Jupiter Experiment. Awesome. That's great. We will definitely get to that. Um, I always like to start in the beginning. Uh, tell me about when you first encountered music. What about it really kind of stuck with you and made you want to pursue it? Well, I grew up in uh, in New York City. I'm a child of the 80s. And uh, so I, I grew up in the heyday of early hip hop. And interestingly, kind of the early days of uh, heavy metal. So I grew up listening to hip hop and Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and uh, really odd mixes of music. I remember even at eight or nine listening to Billy Joel and, and Pink Floyd and just uh, an eclectic mix of music. Sure. And what do you think it was about that that kind of pushed you into it? Was it just kind of a mix of all of those different things that spoke to you and made you want to pursue learning an instrument? It really was. Um, I had so many, so many wild tastes in music and, uh, uh, you know, again, everything from rap to, to metal to contemporary music at the time. And, uh, I never, never really thought about playing an instrument until my, my, I guess kind of a typical story. My, my brother started taking keyboard lessons. I think he was forced to actually, and, uh, his lessons would be over. And then I would just kind of make my way down to the basement and look through his, his books and, and kind of teach myself out of his curriculum on our little, little Casio keyboard. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so I assume those were, would be like the books that you would find in like any sort of music store where they do lessons, just the, the beginner kind of book kind of things. Oh yeah, they were awful, awful, uh, awful, and easy tunes. You know, with the with the letters of the key inside the musical note. You know, on the on the staff. Okay, and then did you ever pursue like private lessons for yourself? I I, I was self taught for years. Uh, I mean, I look back now and I I realize that through all the projects and bands I played and how how terrible I must have been. And it really, it wasn't until I was uh, a little bit older, maybe in my my twenties, that I um. I had taken lessons through my teen years, but my twenties, I got a little bit more serious and in my thirties, a little bit, even, even more serious, um, and, and had some, some great instructors. And I, I think, uh, it was more about correcting self-taught mistakes and getting into theory at that point more than anything else. Okay. So tell me a little bit about, uh, the earlier process of beginning to learn the instrument, uh, up until you were twenties uh, in your twenties, where you said you started to take a little bit more seriously, was it always kind of a hobby at that point? And you just kind of, you know, kept it under your sleeve and just did it in your own time, or did you ever kind of get the sense that it was going to lead to something bigger in your life? I really had no no expectation of it going anywhere other than playing in garage bands and making awful original music, um, and playing with other guys that were were probably just as bad as I was. Um, and it, it really wasn't until um, I, I discovered uh, really like uh, prog rock, um, you know, bands like like Yes and Genesis and. Um, Deep Purple and hearing keyboards as a a lead instrument um, that I really thought like wow this is this is pretty cool I don't have, just have to make uh, you know play chords <laughs> so um, I, I want to say I was thirteen or so um, and I was fortunate enough that my parents bought me a um, Roland D fifty which was like the flagship synth and I'm thinking eighty seven or eighty eight and uh, but even then my 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 musical prowess was like limited to uh just figuring out pink floyd tunes and the occasional rush keyboard solo and um just kind of figuring out what other other people were playing but nothing too complicated okay sure so let's uh move into when you did start to take it more seriously uh what was kind of the impetus for that like what made you decide you wanted to be more serious about it well, that was uh, that was an easy an easy uh, pick to get a little more serious. Now, you know, this is before YouTube was a thing too. Um, but I just I, I got to a point where I I think I realized that I wasn't really able to uh, convey into music what I was hearing in my head, uh, and that was that was really the driving factor to try to figure this stuff out. I my musical 
knowledge was so limited um, to what I was, uh, what I really taught myself and uh, and didn't have access or easy access because access was always there in the form of books and, and lessons, but uh, it wasn't so easy. There was no computer to go on to and just, you know, find Rick Beato and, uh, and, and just consume everything that he puts out. Um, mm-hmm. So that that was really it. I I really wanted to have a better uh, control of the language that is music. Okay, so uh, if I could paraphrase just slightly, I would say, uh, you know, you got to that point creatively where you realized that what you were putting into it wasn't exactly matching what you were expecting to come out. Yeah, that that's pretty accurate. I I don't I I don't I was limited in uh, my ability to to really play what I wanted to play or what I what I heard in my head okay so let's uh move it forward then what what were the steps that you took to begin learning that you said that you started to learn theory and took practice a little bit more seriously uh how did that turn around and show in your creativity well it was a a pretty quick and dramatic uh, change in playing uh it's it's kind of like you just you know unlock these these layers i i had at that point in my playing i had i had good dexterity i had good ability i just didn't have the knowledge to to accompany it uh so i i had found some local teachers um i remember i just couldn't even remember names i had so many instructors um and, uh, so, you know, some guys would just teach you tunes and, uh, some would teach you, uh, scales and some limited theory. And then I took classical lessons for a short while with a couple of different, uh, instructors. Um, and this went on, I, I would take, I would take some instruction and I would buy the books that they would recommend and I would study my ass off with those. And then I'd kind of grow for a little while, um, and then find another instructor and just kind of repeat the process here and there over the years. Interesting. That's uh, I, I, I like that strategy of going at it, of learning, you know, from a bunch of different people to compile that information. And then you're kind of the filter to put out the creativity of all that information that you've been given. I like that. Yeah, I took a took a lot away from from each one of them. Um, I had uh, being a big fan of of prog rock and prog metal. I had uh, I had discovered uh, through following a drummer that I'm a huge fan of. Um, discovered a, a, a keyboardist. Um, his name is Alessandro Bertoni, and uh, just loved his music. It, it just had some great stuff, riff driven keyboard stuff. And uh, found him on social media and saw that he was giving lessons. And now this is only. You know, X amount of years ago, when when you could do virtual lessons, um, which was phenomenal. So I studied with with Alessandro for a little bit, um, and and that was really a huge huge push in 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 my playing. Yeah, that's really cool too. Um, all right, so where where does that put you now? Uh, obviously, your project is the Jupiter Experiment. Tell me about how that came to be. So that was um, I, I'm very fortunate that. Uh, to have a a wife and and you know family that's that's very supportive of of me hiding myself away for a while and and immersing myself in music and uh, we got to a point where um, we were we were building an addition onto our our home and um, building a bigger room for my kid and just just some extra room and I asked my wife while we were doing it if I could build another room to make a studio. And she was all about it. So we added a studio onto the house, uh, which is just like my, my, my haven, my getaway. Um, She's like, finally, no more keyboards in the bedroom. (laughs) Well, that was our life for a very long time. And then, uh, (laughs) then I took the guest bedroom, but she's very creative and has her own hobbies. And she kind of took over that room. So, so, uh, so uh, maybe it was guilt, but whatever it was, it got me a studio. Mm -hmm. Um, and the studio's grown. I have a, a wonderful workspace. Uh, my son is a, a drummer, and we have a nice drum kit in here. And it's really like the walls are adorned with my musical inspirations, and it's um, it's just really a, a comfortable place to come and, and make music. Awesome. I, I interrupted you though, so let's go. Let's go back to uh, how how you kind of came about the Jupiter experiment. Yeah. So I was um, always always playing I'd, I'd have one or two synthesizers at a time you know a workstation and another keyboard and and i was always uh making music um uh, with the integrated sequencer in the machine and 
we built this addition on the house. I set up my studio and you know, I got my computer set up and, and got into digital recording and infinite tracks and, and virtual instruments and discovered this whole world of like, you know, like, you mean, I don't have to have a room full of two, three, four thousand dollars synthesizers to make the sounds that I want. So I, I've been kind of going crazy, um, indulging myself in all these virtual synths and, and electronic synthesizers and, um, and started making music that really exceeded what I was able to do from an editing standpoint uh, in, a, in a single workstation. And just started piling up completed tunes. And one day said, you know, I got to share this stuff. I, I, you know, I think it's a hard plunge for any, any artist is to actually have other people hear your stuff because they have opinions you don't want to hear. Um, but with the, the support of my wife, you know, she's like, you got to release this stuff. And, and of course, now it's become so much easier for an independent artist to push stuff out. Um, so I did. And um came up with kind of a concept that I had in mind, which turned out to be the Jupiter experiment and, and started releasing singles just one at a time for the past a uh, little over a year now. Awesome. That's, that's great. And you're absolutely right. It's more, it's more easier every day for independent artists to release their own music and start gaining a fan base and getting traction. Uh, and one of the things I always talk about uh, throughout these uh, interviews um, is the idea of oversaturation in the market. And people always kind of look down on that and say that there's too many artists out there, but I kind of go the opposite way. And I, I almost don't think that there's enough artists because for every artist out there, there's going to be a fan base that resonates with that personality. And that that's those are the people that you should be looking for. And, you know, you might be somebody's favorite artist and they've just never discovered you. Absolutely. And that's that's really been the most incredible part of this. This ride is uh, is to have the feedback to, to get the feedback that I've had from from people. I, I, I feel funny even using the word fans, but that's what they are. I've, I've had people tell me they can't wait for my my next release and they bookmark it and they. And, uh, you know, guys tell me they, I say guys, fans tell me they, uh, you know, they, they, there's one particular song that they, they listen to every time they go for a run or every time they work out. And it's just that, that, that is, uh, is, is worth the, the little bit of effort. Uh, I say a little bit cause I just enjoy it so much. It's not like really, uh, you know, labor, but, uh, that's just worth all of it. And, uh, I've said so many times just to have one person that loves this stuff, it, you know, it's the same to me as having a thousand or, or a million. It's it really is. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Just a little bit of validation feels so good. Um, all right. So uh, tell me about some of your favorite memories that have stuck out to you to keep you motivated to, you know, continue this project and to, you know, try to seek out that the people that want to hear your music. Well, I I like making music that uh, is a little maybe a little quirky or. Um, a little bit different. I, I really, really uh, don't know how what what genre or box to put my my music in, and um, I think that might resonate with with some people as well. I, there's there's some music I listen to that that might be a little bit obscure, and um, which is what I love about it. And I don't follow typically a you know an ABA or a verse chorus verse or a four uh, format. I just create what I think sounds good. Um, if that makes sense. And, uh, you know, the, the, I go through long periods, I guess we all do. I go through long periods where I think everything I'm, I'm putting out is really not worthy of finishing or releasing. And, um, I've really learned to, as I create to just step away from it, uh, for a, a while, you know, maybe a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. Um, I, I upload everything to the cloud. So when I'm in the car driving, I can kind of go through my catalog of the catalog of crap as I refer to it. And, <laughs> sure. uh, you know, um, and it might be four or five months later that I listen to something and I go, why did I shelf this? <laughs> this mm -hmm. is really good. Um, you know, and I'll go back to it and then finish it from there. And that, that's how a lot of my, uh, my releases have, have come to be. They started off as something I really wasn't crazy about. That's awesome. So how much unreleased material would you say that you have in the, in the catalog of crap, as you called it? <laughs> I have, uh, I would say I'm sitting on probably 25 tunes that are 90% done. 
And I don't even know how many more that were just in just a couple bars or a cool melody that I really liked that I recorded and just haven't got back to. Um, but there's enough to keep me busy. And I, I think one of the problems I find is that regardless of all that stuff, I still sit down and try to come up with new stuff instead of going back and finishing the old. So I think I have this perpetual catalog of unfinished stuff. Sure. sure. Uh, I think that's completely normal for musicians as well to kind of just start an idea, not really kind of know where it's going and come back to it later. Uh, that, that's all completely normal. Um, Absolutely. All right. Well, where can people find the Jupiter experiment and check it out? Well, I am, uh, I think I'm everywhere. Um, let's see, we got uh, SoundCloud and uh, Spotify and Deezer, uh, Apple Store, Amazon. Uh, I think if you can stream it, you can find the Jupiter experiment there. Perfect. Uh, the the old grand old digital distribution is everywhere these days. Um, it's fantastic. It is. Um, all right. Well, so I always like to give the person I'm interviewing the opportunity to put out their last word. So what's a message that you have that you want to share with other people? Well, I'd love to encourage everybody to uh, to find resources such as this podcast and other uh, avenues of finding independent artists. There is so much talent out there, so much talent uh, that may never may never be something mainstream. Uh, but when you listen to interviews on on uh, forums such as this, um, you really get to hear some amazingly talented people and some wonderful music. And I know I've discovered some from listening to your interviews and. Uh, and from using some of the lesser known sources like SoundCloud and, and going and, and seeking out those related artists, um, you'll, you'll really find some great music there. 